Good morning and welcome to Europe is our future and what the EU can do for your business, co-organized by the IIEA and Enterprise Ireland. My name is Joe Lynham and I am the business editor at News Talk. Before that, for 17 or 18 years, I was a correspondent and presenter with the BBC. And um, I've been all around this lovely continent that we share, so I can share some of my anecdotes a bit later. Um, when it comes to the subject matter today, European markets represent significant diversification opportunities for Irish companies. As Ireland prepares to mark 50 years since joining the EEC, which is now, of course, the EU, this webinar will outline, hopefully, what the EU can do for you. This virtual event, which is the opening seminar of the 2022 Europe is Our Future series, co-organized by the IIEA and Enterprise Ireland, will provide an overview of the benefits of trading and doing business in the EU single market, and will discuss the funding opportunities for e that the EU provides for Irish SMEs. We're delighted to be joined today by a group of distinguished speakers who will offer wide-ranging perspectives on the benefits to Irish business of trading and doing business within the single market. Firstly, the 2022 Europe is Our Future series will be opened by a keynote address of roughly 15 minutes by Francis Fitzgerald, member of the European Parliament, of course, for the constituency of Dublin, and the former Tornister and Minister for Business, Enterprise and Innovation. After that, we will hear from Robert Schröder, who is the Head of External Communications for the European Innovation Council and SME's Executive Agency, the snappily titled EISMEA. Robert will outline the supports that are available for Irish companies. After these initial presentations, we will begin a panel discussion and Q&A for an hour to take us to around 9.30 a.m. Irish time, which will feature, in alphabetical order, Daniela Angioni, Research and Grants Officer at InnoPharma, Anne Lanigan, the Regional Director for the Eurozone, Central and Eastern Europe at Enterprise Ireland, Sonia Neary, CEO of Wellola, and Margaret Ray, founder of Conry Innovation. You'll be able to join the discussion, of course, using the Q&A function on Zoom. After two years of doing this, you all know how to mm -hmm. submit your questions on Zoom. And uh, obviously, if I ask you to speak, don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, anyway, so you submit your questions and uh, I will get those and I will then put them to the panel after we've finished hearing from Robert Schröder. Uh, everything is on the record. And as they say in Scotland, shy bairns get nay sweets so do submit your questions please now without further ado let me say a few words about francis fitzgerald who is of course mep for dublin city and county vice president of the epp group in the european parliament prior to her election to the european parliament in 2019 francis served as a finnegale parliamentarian for 20 years and more she served as a senator and a td and her most re uh, she most recently served as tornister which is deputy prime minister robert schroeder uh, 2016 to 17, uh, one of only four women to have held this position. Frances Fitzgerald, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Joe, and good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be joining you uh, this morning, all the members of the Irish business community, members of the IIEA, and uh, of course, Enterprise Ireland. It was always a, an absolute pleasure, I have to say, and I really mean it, to work with Enterprise Ireland when I was Minister for Business. And I have terrific memories of the trade missions that we went on across Europe and elsewhere uh, with Irish business. And Irish businesses have so much to offer. And you know, they really came across very strongly, Joe, on these uh, trade missions and the opportunities also came across. And that's what we're here to talk about this morning. Um, so really delighted to, and thank you for the invitation. Um, what's on my mind right now, just before I get into the theme that we are to discuss this morning is Ukraine. I've just come from Strasbourg where we spent the week discussing what's going on in Ukraine. And of course it's on all of our minds and it is the context in which we meet. Uh, and just to say that yesterday in the parliament, uh, over 500 members of parliament voted for an embargo on Russian oil, gas, coal, nuclear fuels uh, to stop all uh, Russian transport uh, across the EU and so on. Many other sanctions. Uh, you've heard about all of them and the Council will be deciding uh, today, in the next few days, uh, how, which of those sanctions will be put into place immediately. So that's also a context for business and one in the discussions I was part of yesterday where there was a lot of discussion about the impact on economies. Generally, it's felt that the European uh, economy can, can manage these issues, uh, but it will be challenging. 
And I'm very aware that for businesses joining us this morning, uh, that we are dealing with inflationary pressures. We're in a post-COVID situation and we now have the Ukrainian war. And all of these impact on business to varying degrees. And there is a role both for the Irish government and the EU in the context of mitigating some of the impacts of those. And we don't know yet uh, whether this will be short or long term. I've heard some very pessimistic, to be honest with you, um, it, it discussions around this war continuing for quite a long period. Others hoping that it will be shorter and sharper. Nobody really knows at this point. It depends uh, on the resolve of Putin. But as somebody said, he's a man on a mission uh, and a very psychopathic uh, mission, as we can see from all of the sexual violence and what's happening in Ukraine. But that is a context that we have to keep in mind, Joe, and I'm sure it will emerge in the course of the discussions here this morning. So. I'm very aware that uh, the European Union will have to stand in solidarity as it did during COVID, and that will be a great help to business. And the theme this morning is Europe is our future, what the EU can do for your business. And I have to say, I never cease to be impressed by what the European Union is. I never cease uh, to be anything but very, very enthusiastic about the cooperation and the opportunities that I see. I, I started off in politics many years ago, working with NGOs at European level. And I always remember the excitement of coming back to Dublin with ideas from Europe and going there and bringing ideas. And it's the very same for business, I think. And so many years later, when I was elected in 2019, that excitement stays with me. And I think that's really what Enterprise Ireland and IEA represent, uh, that excitement and opportunity. And the question this morning is how to make it real for business and what is the opportunity that's there and is there opportunity for small business? Well, I think, let me just recap very briefly the supports that have come from Europe. Um, we have to keep Europe strong and competitive. And every year, and it's 50 years since we joined, um, it has really transformed Ireland being a member of the European Union. Um, we were a net recipient, as we know, with over 40 billion. And I've been asked to set a, a slightly uh, historic uh, theme as well. Um, we're now, of course, a net contributor um, due to the significant economic growth here, despite the challenges we still face. But um, our contribution really to the EU budget is very small when you consider the opportunities that the and the economic benefits of having access to the EU single market, because a thriving Europe is a thriving Ireland. We're, we're, we're one and the same because we're a small, open trading economy and our economic prosperity does depend on our capacity to sell goods and services on the international market. And our membership of the European Union offers us access to 500 million plus people. So despite the challenges, despite the war in Ukraine, the rapid rise of inflation, COVID-19 uh, recovery and post-Brexit market diversification, as we navigate all of these, the opportunities are still there. And that's what we're talking about today. I think, uh, let me recap on COVID-19. Uh, very challenging time for SMEs, as I'm sure everybody on this call uh, knows very well. Uh, but people have kept going. Some sectors have been impacted more than others. Some have made gains, but not very many. But the business supports that came from the EU across all of the member states during the pandemic helped to support SMEs and business while also limiting the impact on employment and on jobs. And that has been very important. I was reading a, a review recently of the EU and they said the EU was very good during a crisis. It has proved that again and again. Now, actually, they've been better during this crisis uh, than the last one, because the last one, we all know there were some very tough impacts on all our economies. In this one, the EU has raised so much money on the open markets that it has been able to support us during that desperately traumatic period of COVID in a way that I think nobody would have imagined. Small businesses say to me again and again, that's been a, a huge help. The supports that came through and the flexibility that was there in terms of keeping jobs open, in, in terms of keeping businesses thriving. So that was because of decisions right across Europe to make sure that we remained uh, competitive and, and survived actually during that period. Um, one of the points I would make at a European level that we've seen very strongly during COVID, and I think it's going to continue, is the value of, if you like, that joint enterprise we would not have had vaccines to every country in Europe without that central organization that came from the EU. We're talking now in terms of energy supplies, in terms of storage and tendering for energy, 
to have a European approach to that. Now, we have a way to go to develop that, but that's going to make a difference to the cost of energy in the long run. And as we move into renewables, clearly we're going to have to have that European approach as well. And the uh, the RRF, which is this huge amount of money, which is now being made available to all member states, including Ireland, uh, what's at the core of that is that we are green and that we are digital. And there are amounts earmarked which can help SMEs for that green and digital transformation. So uh, there's great opportunity there, I think, for our SMEs. Um, let me say that uh, the single market for goods, services, capital and people is one of the EU's most valuable assets. A competitive single market offers the framework for growth, for job creation and fundamentally raises our standard of living. And I've always felt that creating jobs has to be at the core of, of Irish government policy because the best way out of poverty, the best way to create wealth, to create standard of living is by creating jobs. And we know the vast majority of jobs come from SMEs. I think it can be quite lonely actually being an SME. And I know from my work with Enterprise Ireland how important it is to, for example, build networks and to have transnational contacts. They can all be facilitated by Enterprise Ireland. I think it's easy to talk about market diversification to actually do it needs support. What I remember SMEs telling me when I went, for example, to the RDS, to the various shows there, they would talk to me about having the time to diversify. They would talk to me about having the staff, about the language difficulties, about getting to know those other markets. And these are all challenges, no question. You say diversify into other markets, but just think about going into Sweden, think about going into um, the, the, the Baltic states, think about going into France. I remember on a trade mission to France, seeing huge opportunities that had been taken by Irish SME. But it does require that leap of faith and that support from those who've already done it. And it's been very interesting to hear about, for example, the, the programmes uh, about entering the market, entering the Eurozone, which Enterprise Ireland are running, which really facilitates that entry. Um, SMEs account for 67% of private sector jobs and make up 58% of our GDP. Um, I think SMEs are also keen. I mentioned the green key, I should say. Um, I mentioned the green and digital transformation. SMEs are also key to the transition to a low carbon economy and central to our, our recovery. Uh, and we know that in Ireland, SMEs account for over 70% of employment. So this sector is crucial to the future in Ireland. And it's a challenging future. Geopolitically, as I've said, it's challenging, but also from, from a business point of view. Now, let me ask the question before I finish up. Are Irish SMEs getting the most benefit possible from the EU market? I think the answer has to be at this point, no. Although we have some very good figures, for example, there has been uh, a doubling. Uh, the, the European markets are now a key element of Enterprise Ireland's strategy and Irish exports to the Eurozone have doubled since 2010. Uh, they were 2.85 billion. So, I mean, it's going in the right direction, but I think what we need to do is accelerate that. And, and make sure that far more businesses are taking full advantage of the single market, because the statistics show us that they are not at this point. Neither are SMEs making full use of the digital transformation. Um, so those are two big challenges, but two big opportunities. Definitely going in the right opportunity, but absolutely needs to accelerate. And that is, I think, what the theme of this morning uh, is. It's about developing relationships with Europe, uh, business networks and information portals. They're very important, as I said earlier. It can be very challenging. So I, I think uh, the different uh, financial initiatives, which I'm not going to go into detail on this morning, but the, uh, I've mentioned the recovery and resilient uh, facility. That means that there is a lot of money there to help the, the rollout into other uh, member states and for our own government to support uh, those transitions. Um, I think that uh, we can play a huge role in this. Uh, transition uh, from Ireland because we have a record. I remember being in Galway and going to many of the new uh, small businesses and larger businesses there and seeing the scientific innovation. We have a lot to offer. And I think it's really important that we bring that innovation because one of the big challenges facing Europe is to keep innovation in Europe. 
and the Irish SMEs, small businesses, startups can bring a lot of innovation to Europe. It's a challenge. We keep being overtaken by China and the US and innovation is key to keeping those jobs in Europe and uh, developing enterprise. I think one of the areas that businesses worry about is excessive administrative burdens, because that does affect uh, the growth potential of SMEs across the union. They are a major challenge for about 78% of SMEs, administrative burdens. So in the parliament and elsewhere, we have to do everything uh, to reduce those, while at the same time setting the kind of standards that we want to see. Uh, I'll conclude uh, uh, on a point about uh, gender equality. Extremely important to keep this in mind because we have to, uh, if you like, make sure that we tap into the potential of the whole of our population. I think we're very we're leaders in this in Ireland in many ways when I see what's happening right across Europe. Uh, there's huge potential for businesses to do well by being more diversified, by uh, placing more emphasis on equality, actually, uh, because the evidence seems to be absolutely clear in terms of profits and returns, that if you diversify your board, uh, you see an immediate uh, increase in productivity. Very clear figures coming from the IMF on that. So it's very much in business's interest to make sure uh, that they have a, a diversity and make sure that uh, they're opening doors. Uh, for example, in Europe now, we're bringing in the gender pay transparency uh, directive, which means that businesses will you know, have to say what the wages are and to do comparisons between men and women. So I think I believe it at that, Joe. I hope I've given a, an overall flavour of the thinking in Europe uh, to re-emphasise again the opportunities that I believe are there uh, for SMEs, for Irish SMEs, with the supports from the people who were on the call this morning, I think this can be the decade of real breakthrough for SMEs. I think it has to be, we have to build a stronger Europe and creating jobs within Europe with the help of SMEs is going to be absolutely central to that. Gorami and Amahagat, Francis, thank you so much for that. Um, and I, I would that all politicians spoke to time. That was exactly 15 minutes, Francis. I'm pretty impressed with that, actually. You'll also be glad to know, Francis, that our entire panel is, are women later on. So I'm the only, I'm the token male, just making up the numbers. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. Uh, I, I, up, I, I like the look so, myself. <laughs> warmest regards to you, Francis. We will see you again soon. We're going to raise a lot of the issues that you've raised, I'm sure. Also about not having the time to diversify into Europe. I thought that was really interesting. Um, but thank you so much. Now, let me bring on Robert Schröder, who is the head of external communications for the European Innovation Council and SME's executive agency, EISMEA. Goedemorgen, Robert. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, <clears throat> the invitation to speak here and I'll share my screen. I hope you will be able then to see the presentation that I've prepared. I think you can see it, right? Um, let me have a look. Yes, yes I, I, I see, see it. Nodding. Yes, I see nodding. And uh, yeah, you've already <laughs> mentioned it. It's a very snappy title, Ismea, and uh, I apologize for that. My only point of defense is that that title was chosen before I started as head of external communications. Uh, <laughs> not sure if I would have managed to change it though. Um, I um, I really appreciate the the invitation to speak uh, here this morning um, because I think uh, I would like to echo what Ms. Fitzgerald has been saying about the opportunities, and that's what I've tried to focus on here as well. Um, just very briefly, I will I will just say what the agency that I work for does. It's an what we call an executive agency of the European Commission. And basically what it means is that we implement a number of the programs that have been uh, set up at the EU level. And we try to make sure that they run and that they reach the people that they should reach and that people can make use of it. Um, the agency that I work for is really focused around the programs that we have at the EU level that are um, made to support researchers, innovators, and small and medium enterprises. So. I think uh, the programs that we have really are of, uh, of great interest to, uh, or potentially of great interest to the people here in the, uh, in the webinar today. Um, my focus uh, for today is, is really to talk about the opportunities. Um, Ms. Fitzgerald already talked about the general uh, opportunities that of course the single market of the EU uh, presents to SMEs from across the continent and, uh, and Ireland. 
And what I will talk about here is what the concrete opportunities are that we can offer you. And um, I, uh, I, I make a distinction here by those opportunities that we have in direct financial support so that you as an SME can apply for. And um, then there is another whole set of uh, support uh, that is, that is uh, non-financial, that is really in, in trying to help you run your business in a better way. So I'll try to go through these two um, different uh, categories. To start with the fin financial support programs, um, there are several, there are numerous different programs that we have. And what I will talk about here are the ones that I think are most relevant. Um, the big research and innovation program that we have is uh, Horizon Europe. It's a huge program, 95 billion euros in financial support over uh, a period of seven years. I have to say, however, that the bulk of this funding is going to um, research projects, uh, often at a, what we call a low TRL level, so really quite still far from the market. Um, and most of those projects, they are thematically driven, and most of them are um, open for, um, for consortia. So these are groups of companies that, that will apply. And often this is a mix of research companies who can bring in some SMEs. But what I think is more, um, uh, more relevant for the audience here today is a program that we have started uh, actually very recently, which is called the European Innovation Council. And this is a program that is actually providing financial support to single beneficiaries, as we call it. So single companies um, can apply. It's much closer to the market. It is really about bringing innovation to the market. That's the core business that we have. Uh, we also have a significant budget, over 10 billion euros over seven years. And what we also have is um, for those who have pro um, projects that they submit, but they cannot get the funding simply because we've run out of the money, we provide what we call a seal of excellence. And this is a, a, uh, um, a certificate that you get, which you can then bring to your local authorities who are in charge of um, the cohesion funds that we have, the structural funds that are being uh, spent uh, by, so it's European money that is uh, spent by the local authorities. And you can go there with that certificate and say, I have um, a project that has been uh, approved. It's been uh, deemed to have high quality. There was not enough funding, but then it makes it easier for um, uh, regional authorities to give direct funding with the EU money, but directly to these companies. Um, I'll talk about the European Innovation Council just in one second. I just want to go to two other um, uh, financial support programs that we have that I think can be relevant. We have a Digital Europe program. This is, of course, as the name says, all about digitization. Um, and also there is eligibility for, um, for SMEs to directly um, uh, apply to, to funding in that program. And another thing I think is really useful, and I've, I've put all the links to these things later on in the presentation, which uh, I suppose will be shared with you, um, is access to finance. So this is a, a portal that you can um, select in the country where you are and what type of uh, financing you're looking for. And it really gives you step by step all the kinds of advice on how you can actually uh, attract uh, either loans, microfinance, uh, guarantees, venture capital. So it's a really useful tool that you should um, really look at, uh, very local based, giving you advice on how you can get further funding. Um, as I said, I just wanted to go into this European Innovation Council because I think it's the most concrete way that we have to support SMEs with direct finance. Um, you will see here, I, I will only focus on what we call the accelerator. The program has also uh, parts for more research uh, oriented uh, activities and then uh, a transition. But I think for this audience, again, the accelerator is the most relevant because it's really to support companies that are very close to the market that are in innovation um, and that want uh, to, to get some financial support. So the, I would say that the main element here is that we, uh, for the first time, we can combine grants of up to two and a half million euros with um, venture capital, with equity funding. So it's really an opportunity to submit proposals for your company to grow and to get both a grant. You can also ask only for a grant, but if you are interested in that, you can also apply 
for equity uh, funding to um, to further grow your company and of course to attract also other investors. It's a very successful program and it's, it's a very new program and it's really um, helping companies to, to grow. We're focused on deep tech um, and we have certain calls that are more challenge based, for example, in, um, in green tech or in healthcare, but we also have what we call an open part, um, which receives about half of the 1.16 uh, billion euros that we have for this year for any open proposals, uh, as long as it's in um, technology and innovation. Uh, Mr. Chair also talked about the um, decreasing the administrative burden, and this is really something that we've been trying very hard with this program to do. We have two stages where so you can submit a very simplified um, proposal. You will get a response in four weeks, whether it's good or not, whether it uh, has the potential to, uh, to get uh, funding. And if you get the response, so you can, you can su uh, submit your proposals at any time of the year, Within four weeks, you get a response, and then we have several what we call cutoff dates uh, throughout the year for the full applications, which will then get a, a, a more deep analysis and uh, the funding decision will be based on that. Um, these cutoffs, we, we've actually just had one and the next one is in June and then another one in October. And so this is real opportunities for, um, for the money that often uh, SMEs are looking for to, um, to grow and to um, particularly to reach the market. Um, I would now just go into the non-financial support programs that we have, um, still linked to this European Innovation Council, which I just um, talked about before. Uh, the novelty there is that we also, for those companies that we do fund, so the, for the beneficiaries of our program, we do not just stop with providing them the money, we actually bring a whole range of other support, uh, which we call business acceleration services. So. If you are a beneficiary, you get the money and a full support program, which is um, access to mentoring. It is um, expertise that we can bring, trainings. We bring you to, um, to um, uh, trade fairs uh, in Europe and beyond. Uh, there's a community of peers for exchanges. So there's a real support program around that. We also have another um, program, which is called the European Innovation Ecosystems. And there we have a lot of scale of initiatives, again, for companies to help them to match them, for example, with large corporates and to start working together with them to look into finance opportunities. But also here, and it's also something uh, Ms. Fitzgerald already uh, referred to, we have a specific program to help female entrepreneurs. Uh, it's called the Women Tech EU program, where we provide small additional grants, but um, we also give the opportunities there for mentoring and trainings uh, for these uh, female entrepreneurs to, uh, to succeed with their companies in the market. Um, another program I want to um, talk about, because this is really the program that has been dedicated uh, to support SMEs, um, is within the single market program. This is a program that is um, set up by the department that is dealing with the internal market of the EU with entrepreneurs, with SMEs. And um, this is really, the, the, the broad program is really to support people doing business across the single market. That's the basic rationale of this program. Um, so it's really there to, uh, to help smoothen the functioning of the, uh, of the single market. And some of the more concrete elements that are relevant um, and where there's a lot of support for SMEs is, is what we call the SME pillar. So this is really there to support SMEs in creating more competitiveness, their innovation capacities, but it, it creates a lot of support, concrete support that you can have access to in, um, for example, intellectual property rights. Um, knowing what is possible on standardization. It is a program that is running the, the drive for further standardization to ease the business, but it also has the help desk to, to answer all the questions that you may have about what standards are applicable and, um, and what is still uh, to be done. And also um, discussions about what still the barriers to, to the business are in helping you uh, remove that. Because very often, and it's another in, uh, initiative that we have started, for example, is called Innovation Deals. Um, there are a lot of barriers with uh, bringing your innovations to the market, and often these are uh, legal barriers. Um, but in many of the cases, this is actually a perception. 
that there's a perceived barrier because it's complex and everybody knows it is complex. And often it's just helping and talking about that with the experts that you can actually realize that the real barrier may actually be more of a perception than a real barrier. And you can find ways dealing with that if you know what the situation is and where the flexibility in the system is. Um, so another, uh, some of the elements that are being offered here is, is um, just guiding uh, you in your business with, for example, tax issues, hugely complex issues, and there are people that can just help you to explain the rules and, uh, and, and do that. So it's, it's a lot of things are just available there. Um, two other things I wanted to, um, to talk about before um, finalizing is the Enterprise Europe net Network. Um, this is a, an enormously helpful network uh, for companies to, to grow internationally. And that means within the internal market, but also outside the internal market. Um, it can help companies just to get advice on how to innovate themselves, for example, business model innovation. Now, there's a lot of discussion about, for example, the circular economy, but what does it mean for your business model if you want to move into a circular economy? Because it's a different type of, um, of doing business than uh, more traditional um, businesses. Um, help you to, uh, to go abroad. Now there's, uh, again, trade fairs. There are uh, centers for support in if you want to do business in Japan or in China. So there are a lot of these kinds of um, uh, support systems there that can help you. Um, the EEN has been present in Ireland over the past years, and uh, we, we expect that soon again this will be uh, available in Ireland. And it's really something I would... Um, suggest to to contact and to talk about because there's such an enormous wealth of information there and context that uh, that I would make use of. Um, the last thing, uh, it's a small program that we've started recently, which is called Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs. And this really just gives the opportunity for young entrepreneurs to to do a traineeship, if you will, to to go abroad, um, to go to other companies, see how they do business, see how they are, for example, um, uh, doing business throughout the single market just to learn um, and to, to take that knowledge back into your own business. Um, I will just finalize with a couple of recommendations. Um, if you are looking for funding, it is very competitive, but it, and it is excellence based. So it's really the whole uh, idea of the funding programs that we have is that we fund the best. And what that means, of course, is that there is strong competition in the first place because it's open to the, to all of Europe. And there are a lot of people that are applying for that and that have good ideas. Now, what does it mean? There are enormous opportunities. There is, an, uh, there is a very significant budget. But if you want to increase your chances of success there, there are just a few very basic steps. Look very carefully at the requirements. Of course, this is the first thing. I mean, these are very obvious things uh, that I say, but I think it's important to remind. Look very carefully at what the requirements are, what the criteria are before you submit something. But also prepare well in advance because it can take time. Uh, we, we are making some steps that we do these first proposals on a very short thing where it's just really about the idea but if you go for the full proposals do it well take your time because it will hugely increase your your uh, chances of success if you take the time and to prepare well and it's also a word of caution because there are a lot of companies out there that are um, willing to support you in that be careful about who you select to work with. See if they have a track record of success there, because there are also a lot of companies who are just their business model is to make use of all these companies who have very little knowledge and they would try to, to help you in that, but maybe not always with the right expertise um, and the right experience. So make use of them by all means, but look at who they are and uh, what the track record is. Um, another point I want to, to, uh, to say just to, to finish is um, don't, we, we realize that people always see um, the EU as something very distant. Of course, it is, um, it is very abstract often and is distant, but never hesitate to contact people that work there. All the details are online and generally people working in the European Commission or in the agencies are very, very open to help and to, um, to, to help people further. 
Um, so never hesitate, never think that it is something that is far away. Just pick up the phone, write an email, and people are often really, um, really open to help you. And if they cannot help themselves, to refer you to other people. So make use of these opportunities because they really are there. Um, as a last slide here, uh, again, I, uh, I suppose the slides will be shared with, uh, with all of you. I've just listed a whole number of, uh, of links, uh, look through them. Some of them are link, are the same page, but, but more detailed uh, pages, but there really is a wealth of information available on the, intern uh, on the internet. So browse through them. And as I said, contact the people if you want. Um, I won't go through it now, but you will see it in the, sli in the slides. I've put two examples, concrete examples of companies who have been helped through uh, the different programs. Um, so just for you to get a better idea on the type of support, uh, concrete support companies have uh, received in, uh, in, in real circumstances. Um, Joe, I will leave it at that. I think I have slightly overrun my time, um, but uh, of course- I'm, Yes, uh, very you will be charged uh, what they call in the Netherlands a boeskels uh, for going <laughs> two minutes over. Um, that's what you get when you park on the wrong side of the road in the Netherlands, especially in Amsterdam, Robert, as you know. Um, thank you so much. Hartelijk uh, bedankt. That was fantastic. Now, quick question. Those slides, they're very useful. Could, are you sharing them, Robert, or could you share them with, with the EIA? Great. That would be great. Uh, and um, we could then give them out and put them on the website, I'm guessing. Um, I'm looking at Anne from EI and I'm looking at Dara from the IIEA. Uh, to we can we can we can get those out, uh, and I appreciate you doing that, Robert, because uh, that last website showed a whole plethora of websites, and uh, it goes to the question that everyone asks, and it said, well, you know, is there a one-stop shop that for the EU? So if you are an SME, where do you go, or who do you call when you want to call Europe? It's the old one. Um, so uh, there's a there's a plethora of places you can start. I was particularly impressed with the fact that you, um, uh, you there's a you promised to get a response. Did you say within forty days? I can't remember. Was that that you would four get a weeks. four weeks? Yeah, that's not bad. You know, good luck at getting a response from Dublin Corporation uh, within four weeks uh, on anything to do with parking or something like that. So thank you so much for letting us know that you will get. That's not the formal approval, but you will get a response. I presume is that right, Robert? Right. It's, now, it's, go ahead. No, I, just to, to clarify indeed. So you get a response. Is there any potential in this? If yes, then you can go to the next stage with a full proposal. So it just saves you time in not having to go through a full proposal at first stage, which takes a lot of time and energy to, to prepare and then get a no. It gives you the answer in four weeks to say, there is real potential in here. Go ahead and prepare your full proposal, which we will then examine. And then of course, there's still the, the, the chance that you will not get the funding, but it will stop you from doing an enormous uh, amount of work with very little certainty. Yes, and the other thing uh, for anyone listening in there is attention to detail, Robert. Attention to detail. Don't just slop something on paper. Do your research. Make sure you don't have any embarrassing spelling mistakes. Uh, and look at the criteria, because one thing uh, is for sure when it comes to the European Union, when they write a criteria down, they mean those criteria they don't mean oh well if you have one or two of them you should be okay uh so try to uh, you know stick to the you know high standards that we that every sme needs and every sme probably will have uh, on that side robert can you stay with us and listen into our panel discussion in case we need to come back to you sure wonderful thank you so much now before we go to our panel discussion just a quick reminder to all the shy children out there not getting any sweets please submit your questions Use the bottom right of your uh, Zoom function to submit your questions. We have uh, a panel of SMEs who have all availed of European funding in some way, shape or form and whose knowledge you should want to tap into. And of course, we have Robert and we still have the wonderful uh, Francis Fitzgerald, who is uh, listening in as well. Um, thank you so much for, for staying on, Francis. I know you're a busy lady. We already heard you this morning on News Talk Radio. Great network, by the way. Everyone should, I hope you should subscribe to Business Breakfast with yours truly. Uh, anyway, submit your questions now. And I'm going to go through our panel, all women, um, in alphabetical order. I'm going to say a few words about them. And then they're going to say a few words about themselves and um, how they found uh, applying uh, for EU support, whether that was financial or just um, emotional <laughs> support. Uh, so um, 
I'd like to say a buongiorno to uh, Daniela Angione, who is a senior research fellow and principal in investigator with 10 years of experience in research and development, research commercialization, and project management. She has a diverse scientific background that ranges from physical chemistry to electronics to biology, with a research focus on diagnostic devices, design, and development. Go bit of alliteration there. She has worked in cutting edge research groups in the field of bioelectronics, adaptive materials, uh, I don't know these things either, and sensors contributing to a number of European Union funded research projects on a collaborative, proje uh, collaborative project with a team in the United States of America. Buongiorno Daniela, how did you get on when it came to getting EU support? Good morning, everybody, and thanks, Joe, for this introduction. Um, well, um, I, I have always been uh, connected with uh, EU and EU support. Um, you have uh, you have introduced me as a, a principal investigator. I have a, I have ten years of uh, um, experience in in academia, and and you know, as you well probably all know, um, you really. Um, in order to develop, so when we are in academia, um, the beauty of being there, but the beauty in general of, of the work, uh, at least that, that I do in technology and, and in science, is to develop um, ideas, uh, is to have ideas and try and then to develop them and to and to um, realize and develop into products. Um, so in order to do that, you, you always need to get funding. And the, the best way, I think, to, to uh, to do that is uh, looking at the uh, wide range of opportunities that are available there uh, from EU. Um, I also got funded at, at national level, so I have to say, even you know within Ireland, there are other opportunities. But the EU, um, uh, there's so many uh, diverse um, scheme and programs uh, at different stage of um, your uh, journey uh, across across um, uh, your career. Um, and uh, now, as you said, I spent eight years in academia, but now, you know, I am a research and grant officer in InnoPharma, um, which is a, a, an SME, um, is an Irish SME. And um, even before I joined uh, the company, they've always uh, been, um, um, they all, always bailed of EU funding, so at national level, but also European level. And that, I think, also is the key uh, and how the way the way it, that they expanded so and they grow so um, so quickly uh, in their business. Um, so I'd say that's that's um, a bit of uh, my point of view on new funding and how they are absolutely uh, crucial um, in in our you know in our career in, in, for business. Well, we will come back to you, Daniela. Thank you so much for that. And I'm going to bring in now Anne Lanigan. She joined Enterprise Ireland in 2003 and has held a number of management positions, including director of the Tokyo office and head of the Brexit unit. So that was a quiet unit, I suspect. And she has been a driver of change within the organization and a key architect of Enterprise Ireland's proprietary client engagement model. Uh, a mechanical engineer by training and spent 18 years in the private sector before joining Enterprise Ireland. And... I will bring in the other entrepreneurs a little, in a little bit moment, but from your perspective, from Enterprise Ireland's perspective, what sort of supports do you think that uh, SMEs should think about immediately when they're thinking about getting into the Eurozone market? Thanks, Joe. Um, as you said, I'm the Regional Director for Europe in Enterprise Ireland, and I think that all of our audience know that Enterprise Ireland is responsible for the development of Irish-owned business. And we have a particular focus on exports. We see this as the route to growth. So my role and my responsibility is the growth of our clients' exports into the EU. Um, so basically making Europe our future. Um, I'm based in Amsterdam um, and responsible for 11 offices across nine countries. And those offices are populated with market advisors. And those market advisors work one-to-one -one with our client companies. And that's probably the key support that we provide for our clients in terms of helping them to enter and win business in the European markets. But before clients get to a point where our market advisors can help them, it's really important um, that a company will do some work themselves. Um, and so market research, for example, we have a state-of-the-art um, market research facility, um, which is now all online. 
Um, we also have a number of funding supports, which I won't go into now, but, but a number of funding supports that will help companies on their way. And as Francis mentioned earlier, we have what we call the Enter the Eurozone program, which works with companies bringing them through a process in a Berlin business school where they develop a market entry plan. But today's focus is on the European supports. And I think that's something that would, we would really like to help our clients to access also. So Robert talked about them um, earlier today. And if companies are struggling to see which supports might suit them, we are very happy in our offices across Europe to talk to companies and to help them to identify what supports might help them to accelerate their entry into the market. Brilliant. I'll come back to you, obviously, and thank you so much for that. Uh, and now let's move on to Sonia Neary, uh, with over 17 years experience working as a physiotherapist in Irish healthcare. She's now the CEO and co-founder of Wellola. Is that Wellola or Wellola? It's Wellola, yeah, perfect. Wellola. Thank Good you. Good morning, Sonia. Um, you're a big believer in leveraging digital technology to support self-management care models. Tell us more. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So our, our company is a Dublin based digital health software firm. Um, I, you know, our vision is that only the sickest of the sick are cared for in a hospital setting. Uh, we don't feel it's the right setting for many patients and my co-founder is a medic and both of us have worked at the co-face. Um, so our, our, our platform really is designed to support care providers to care for their patients in the community to offer preventative and community based care. Um, and so, yeah, we've been very fortunate, both from the supports that we've gotten from Enterprise Ireland and multiple supports that we've gotten from the EU. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here today to, to impart some of that experience uh, to the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. And finally, last but definitely not least, uh, Margaret Ray is the founder of Conry Innovation, an early stage startup developing technology to manage and control sea lice in an, uh, hopefully I get this right, sam salmonid aquaculture. Is that right? You're, you're on mute, Margaret. You might want to unmute yourself. Yeah, that's right, Joe. Uh, salmon aquaculture, basically salmon and trout. Um, so, yeah, Conry Innovation is helping salmon farmers produce happier, healthier and heavier fish at sea. And we're using machine learning and artificial technology to help that. Um, so I'm a very early stage uh, company and uh, we're delighted to win um, the Women Tech EU Award. They're recently announced uh, in, in March. Um, and uh, it's, uh, as, as Francis was saying earlier, um, the EU and the European Commission are really putting a lot of supports in place for um, boosting gender diversity uh, and, and, and supports for that. So um, Conry Innovation was one of the uh, 50, 50 companies uh, awarded um, this uh, Women Tech EU Award. So we're delighted with that. Um, for those listening, for other women listening, um, it's helping to support women-led companies. Um, so those in the C-suite uh, basically can apply and they get 75,000 euros worth of support. Uh, and in addition to that, as, as Robert Shorter mentioned earlier, um, the Business Acceleration Services also offer support in terms of mentoring and coaching. Um, and that's, as, as uh, Francis said earlier, um, you know, the, the, that whole uh, language side of things and uh, getting involved in Europe and the European uh, market that's there. So um, I'm looking forward to uh, getting that mentoring and uh, experience with a wider network beyond Ireland. Wonderful, Margaret. Uh, thank you. Stay with us, Margaret. I'm going to go back to Robert. Robert, could you unmute yourself and answer this question that we've got in from Andy Maguire from the Technological University of Dublin? Uh, Robert, um, does Robert have a breakdown of micro business support, i.e. up to 10 people, against non-micro SMEs up to 250 people and 250 staff, as the service sector for micro SMEs tends to be different to those required by quite large Irish standards SMEs? Robert, do you you'd have a breakdown of micro versus kind of normal size SMEs? I'm afraid I do not. I, I, to be honest, I'm not sure if I completely understand the question. In, in if it, if it's referring to how many companies we support, how many who are tiny companies? Doctor. Yeah, I think it's asking. Um, uh, do you support tiny companies, i.e., less than ten staff? We we do we do, but I do not have a breakdown of um, of how much support either uh, is getting, but. 
In particular, for example, the uh, European Innovation Council, um, which I've talked about before, this is really supporting startups. So uh, micro SMEs um, with, with two, three, four, five people um, is, is what we're really uh, there for, um, as much as to the larger. Um, I would say the, the, the Innovation Council is really for, there for startups and less so for the, uh, the larger um, companies. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Robert. And I, I literally, I just threw that at you. I didn't expect you to have the exact stats to hand, uh, but I wanted to make sure you were still awake and you'd had your coffee and all that stuff. So thank you very much for that. And um, now let's go back. Uh, Anne, can I come to you, Anne from Enterprise Ireland? Um, we saw there that Irish companies uh, are a bit nervous about going into uh, a non-English speaking environment. Um, Irish people don't tend to to speak foreign languages fluently, but you know, they may need to, isn't that right? Well, certainly um, there's no English speaking country in the EU, so they all have their own language. So realistically, if you want to do business with somebody, you need to speak the language of your customer. Um, so it is important to address language. Now, there are countries where language is less of a problem than others, for example, where I live here in the Netherlands. But having said that, it's still very important that you do actually, you are able to operate in the language of the country. And there are lots of solutions to that. You know, for example, you can recruit somebody who speaks a language. We have a, a grad start program, which allows companies, um, we actually cover 70% of the cost of the salary of that person for two years if they speak a language that is relevant to your business. So, you know, there, there are supports like that that can help. When you're recruiting a sales and marketing person, recruit somebody who speaks a language relevant to your business. And, um, you know, you can use interpreters and um, there are services out there. And one of the things that a lot of our companies do is they find a partner in market who they work with, who obviously has the language. And so that overcomes it, but it does need to be addressed. It is terribly important to get the language piece right. And we have a number of companies who do win business through English. I always say to them, you could win 10 times more business if you have the language. So, so I understand this, uh, do they kind of rock up in Germany and send emails in English to, to potential German customers, et cetera, and expect a response in English? Yeah, and, and a lot of the time they do get responses. You know, Germany is a country where actually English is, is spoken in business quite, quite frequently. But my point is that, you know, they get a better response and maybe a faster response and more responses if they were able to deal with the language. I don't want to put companies off and say you can't do business if you don't have a German speaker in your company. What I'm saying is that we will talk to you and help you to address that. But you can get started straight away and it is possible um, to, to do a certain amount of business through English. OK, well, let's go back to some of our entrepreneurs. Um, Sonia. Are you, where are you selling uh, elsewhere in the Eurozone? So we're currently Ireland, the UK, Italy, and we're looking at expanding into Germany. Um, we've had really fantastic supports from an entity called the uh, European Institute of Technology and Innovation. Uh, they have um, industry supports. You know, we're in healthcare, but they do support other industries. Um, and for example, with them, we've availed of the Digital Health Validator Bootcamp. I did that in Trinity. And quite like what Alan was saying there, it opened up funding for us, but also they brought us all around Europe and we met fantastic partners, uh, living labs, academic partners, potential customers. And it kind of gives you the confidence to put a foot on the ground in another entity, in another country, in another market, shake hands with the people. And now that we're allowed <laughs> um, and, and, and find partners that can help you distribute your product there and um, we also availed of the mentor and coaching network that they have that's given us a mentor in Germany uh, Dr Carl Quant who again has supported us with market analysis finding potential distributors and partners in Germany again very much you know people buy from local people that they know and, and that can really help to kind of learn that um, and we work with Swala Ventures in Barcelona who again are a Spanish entity supporting our marketing campaign so you know little things that have been you know that we've learned is have your website available in the local language make your flyers and your marketing material available in the local language I often get a comment of god this is great you're an Irish company but I'm seeing the site in German you know um, um, so it's little simple things like that. Um, but yeah, we've, we've gotten great support from EIT. Um, we're also working towards the EI, have a market discovery fund, again, to support you to, to, to gain access and, and to gain funding and support into a new, into a new uh, market. Um, and we are applying for 
Robert uh, mentioned there, the European Innovation Council, the Accelerator, uh, which, which at the moment is open and we're in the process of applying there. So we've been very lucky uh, with a number of really fantastic supports and I'm happy to talk further uh, on that. Well, let me follow up, Sonia, and say, well, you said you're, you're selling your, your services, Walola services, uh, yeah. in Italy. What if someone messaged you in Italiano? So again, it's about having a local partner on the ground there that can speak the language, that can support, that can offer technical support, etc. Um, and that's been a learning curve. You know, that definitely isn't something that, that we can manage uh, from, from the Dublin office uh, with English and Irish speakers. Um, so, and, and as it's, it's interesting, we, we have team members now. So we, we had interns, for example, that came to us from Germany. They went back to Germany and they now are working for us from Germany. Um, so, so there is a kind of a nice way sometimes to, to, to trial people I mean, I think from a hiring perspective, the market operationally is wide open and we can now hire people in Spain and, and, and Portugal and Germany and Italy uh, with relative ease and engage them in our team as easily as someone who sits beside us in the office in, in the GEC in Dublin. So, um, yeah, absolutely. It's really important that you, that you have that local presence. Well, let me bring in Daniela and Gioni from uh, InnoPharma. Uh, if you could unmute yourself, Daniela. Um, you speak fluent English, obviously Italian, but what if you want to sell some research project or some of your services in Poland, for example? What would you do? What have you done? Um, well, I think over the years, um, I think one of the reasons why um, InnoPharma as um, like we, we sell uh, the products all over Europe, but not only Europe. Um, yeah, you mentioned Poland, but there's also uh, we have um, clients in, in Japan, for example. Um, or, How's or your Japanese, Japan. Daniela? Well, not not very good, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm afraid. Joe. Um, but I, I mean, yeah, the language is, is one uh, main problem. But uh, um, I think um, connect, connecting with the people um, and, you know, like, as you said, I, I speak English fluent and English is a way, is a bridge, you know, to connecting to people. Um, and then also um, there are, as, as Sonia also mentioned, a way to um, engage and, and engage with people that are um, maybe not Japanese, uh, but that there, there's, a, there's a branch of the Japanese uh, indus, um, sorry, company uh, in Europe that can speak the language. Uh, in Poland, uh, well, it might be a bit more um, challenging, but there's always find it is always um, the way to find a local support there that would speak the language, and and so they can we can reach out to them. But I think um, going through the um, European funding, it puts you in. Uh, I think the main reason, because I think that's that's why you know we are we are here talking about our experience of getting the funding from you. It puts you in a network of. Uh, people and connections and uh, com between companies and, and uh, RTOs. Um, and within this network, uh, there would be a way to um, find um, um, a client or, or a, a partner in, in different countries in Europe that would um, uh, in some way interact with you and, and speak to you and, and, and uh, connect uh, to you. So I think the, the, the main advantage and I think the low hanging fruit of uh, being in the, in the EU is, um, uh, is actually uh, the visibility. So bring yourself visible, the company and your product and your skills visible to um, the other you know, European country and the people within Europe, uh, but also uh, connect. Uh, with other people. I think that's the main, I mean, I loved um, what Francis said this morning about the excitement of, um, uh, you know, going to Brussels and talking to other people in Europe and then um, going back to, to where you come from, to Dublin uh, or anywhere, any other place uh, with the excitement of the ideas that, um, that you have discussed with, uh, with other people. And, and, and that's exactly what would be the beauty of, um, um, of availing and, and putting yourself out there and availing of EU funding and even reaching out to other countries like Poland, that probably is not an immediate um, a, a person that you would do, but like that, the, 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 um, the excitement of talking to them on getting new perspective of what could be uh, your, your product and the way you know, you're going forward in your, in your development of your product within your company. I think that's the, the beauty of it. Um, 
I don't know if that makes sense. No, that answered the question very well. Uh, Grazia and Daniela. Can I go back to Robert, please? If you could unmute. I have a question for you. It's a slightly easier one, Robert. Don't worry. You can put down that bottle of uh, Mogadon. Um, question from James Kett for Robert Schroeder uh, from the European Innovation Council. Um, can you ask Robert where he would apply, where you would apply or one would apply for the grant of up to 15 million euros in equity support? Because I thought the equity support that you mentioned, Robert, was quite interesting. I also wondered who takes the equity stake? Because I'm, I'm guessing the European Union um, in the Berlin Mall doesn't take a stake in SMEs when they're starting up. So the... Um... If you look at the, uh, when you will receive the slides, there's a link to the European Innovation Council and there's a direct link there to how you can apply for the funding. Um, and so there for this, um, if you apply for the funding of the EIC Accelerator, um, there during the application, you can um, indicate whether you are um, going to apply for a grant of up to two and a half million euros. And if you wish so, for um, uh, equity investment of up to 15 million euros. Actually, we're starting with a, with a pilot now to go even beyond 15 million euros. Um, so this is really up to the, um, uh, the candidates to indicate what they are interested in. And, and so we have these two options, either uh, a grant of up to, so you don't have to go to the maximum, and then um, the, the equity part <clears throat> of up to 15 million. The decisions are being taken by, we have um, an EIC fund, as we call it, which, uh, uh, and, and that has a, um, uh, an investment committee that is actually taking the, uh, the investment decision based on, of course, the, the project proposal, etc. cetera. Um, one, one part that perhaps is interesting also to mention there, it's, it's really a new approach, is that um, we are, traditionally have always been doing our evaluations of the applications uh, just uh, say on paper and we get the paper uh, applications and then people uh, different uh, evaluators look at that what we've introduced now is um, that we for the accelerator actually have um, a real interview so we have innovators so it's a it's a panel of um, innovators investors or uh, relevant people who actually will discuss with the applicant um, to see whether um, not only uh, the, the application and the proposal is good and ha has this high potential, but also to see more who is behind it. And that, of course, is critical for the success as well. As I mentioned before, sometimes you have uh, consultants who actually prepare proposals, um, but the people who have to do it may not be. Uh, it's sometimes easier to write a good proposal than actually to implement uh, the project. So um, this is really a, a very interesting thing that we've started doing by having these these live interviews to get to know the people that are behind it. It also gives us come uh, the confidence to fund and to give these grants. Um, and and it is us who is taking a stake in these companies uh, through the um, through the EIC fund and um, the European um, uh, Investment Fund. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, I will come to um, Anne Lanigan from Enterprise Ireland in a moment. Just a quick, uh, I think it's more of a compliment than anything else for Sonia, and it's from potential competitor, Sonia. So watch this one. Uh, Sheila McNeil, who is with Triple Therapy in Sligo, just wondering whether there is a role for physiotherapists in the European model. Quote, great to see you here, Sonia. That's very kind. <laughs> uh, now, let me go to Anne Lanigan from Enterprise Ireland. Do you think the European Union is any good at selling itself, i.e. getting the message out, blowing its own trumpet, dare I say? Well, are you asking me to criticise the European Union? Um, I'm asking you to be, to be clear and open with would-be um, SMEs who may find the alphabet soup of organizations, agencies, directorates, whatever you want to call it, very daunting. And that's before the language and culture difference come into play. Yeah, yeah. And um, I do think um, th there is, is enormous amount of support. The EU is a fantastic, um, I mean, I'm not even sure what we call it, but you know, we've been in it 50 years now. It has made an enormous difference to Ireland. It has made an enormous difference to Europe. Um, but I totally understand how um, people might find it daunting. I find it daunting. I think the um, supports that are available are complex and there are an awful lot of them. And so it is very difficult to identify which are the supports that might work for you. 
And that's where I think our three um, um, panelists today can give great insights into how they identify the supports and how useful they found those supports. So it, it is a matter of, I guess, a little bit of homework. And maybe as Irish people, we don't really like to have to do that. But there is an element of work involved in, in identifying what helps you. But as I said earlier, our market advisors in our offices across Europe are very happy to talk to companies and help them to identify which are the right supports for them. And remember, there are supports coming from Enterprise Ireland, there are supports coming from the EU, and it's a mix of those that will be best for most companies. But I don't believe that Irish companies are availing of, you know, anywhere close to what they could avail of within the EU. And that's why we're having this webinar today to try and highlight the fact that these supports are there, they're there for you. And, and you know, it's something that we would certainly encourage companies to, to come to us to talk about and to access directly. I did see a question there as well about if you're a Leo client, are these EU supports available to you? Yes, they are. Um, and and so there is well, no for issue those of us that. who don't know what a Leo client and I presume it's nothing to do with Leo Varadkar, but uh, what what is a Leo client? Yeah, we have a lot of Leos now. Our CEO is also Leo, so um, Leo is local um, enterprise office, and they support businesses that employ less than ten people, um, and and those companies also need to be looking at exporting. And I know that there's a number of them in the audience today. Um, and, and remember also that those Leo clients um, can get access to our market research center. If they talk to their account manager in their Leo, they will be able to get access to our market research center, which could be invaluable for them also. Okay, uh, let's bring in Margaret, bring back in Margaret, please. Um, uh, Margaret Ray, uh, uh, Margaret, your own, story is is you're you're selling a service though on 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 how to deal with aquaculture um are you also involved in the physical manufacture of these salmon and this uh, this uh, these fish uh, and do you know of the difference that could be uh, the, the different some different supports you could get if you are physically moving products to continental europe Okay. <clears throat> well, first off, I'm, I'm not actually um, in salmon aquaculture myself. I'm, I'm not a salmon producer myself, um, but I'm an early stage uh, startup. Um, and what we're developing is, uh, is, a, is an underwater drone um, coupled with machine learning and artificial intelligence to help um, salmon producers produce healthier fish, basically, at the end of the day. Um, I'm uh, on the New Frontiers program. That's uh, Enterprise Ireland's national entrepreneurship program at uh, Galway Mayo Institute of Technology Innovation Hub. And we, we get mentorship there on our markets as well. So, so through this program, I'm getting some mentorship in terms of exports and uh, how to export um, to, to Europe. Um, but I'm definitely looking up the European Enterprise Network when I, when I get back. Uh, into yeah, it's the a office really interesting proper. one, isn't it? It's, really? kind of like a, it's kind of like a giant WhatsApp group, isn't it, Robert? Absolutely. I, 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 I'm definitely trying to get into that. Um, I think it's really necessary, as, as Anne said earlier, to do that homework. Uh, for instance, I thought I couldn't apply to this Women Tech EU. I thought it was far too early. I thought con reinnovation was too early uh, a stage to, to do it. But I did my homework. And as Robert said there, I actually did shoot off an email um, to Esmia. Uh, to, to find out if I was, uh, you know, if the company itself was uh, uh, eligible to apply. Uh, and it came back, yes, uh, I was elig eligible to apply. So then I did. Within a four weeks, more. did you get a reply? Oh, actually, sooner than that. Um, I there got go, it Robert, within, uh, within about a week uh, of it. Um, and I, I would advise everybody here to subscribe to the newsletters you know, and, and to the programs uh, do that because you get to hear of the calls that are coming out and you get to hear of other people who have been successful. And as we like to do in Ireland, we like to network actually with other Irish companies as well that have been successful. And, and through that network, you know, you, you begin to, to get a feel for what's out there. Um, I would encourage everybody do the homework. Um, set your company up on the um, European portal, that European participant portal early. Uh, so it's all set up um, and then you can apply when your call comes out uh, and that type of thing, a call that's specific for you. Um, I'm really, really happy 
um, that we were selected. There were 391 applications and 50 companies at the end of the day were awarded it. So um, I'm a prime example of somebody who really at the beginning didn't think she was eligible, you know, um, and, you know, slowly but surely got to find out that I was eligible. And, and then you do have to put in a lot of effort. And as Robert said earlier, uh, prepare well, uh, keep, you know, have a look at the criteria and have a look at what you need to put up in the portfolio. Because sometimes, you know, it's not just the proposal, but there are other bits of pieces of proofs for various different things that you need to do. And if you don't do that, no matter how good your proposal is, it won't get through. Yeah. You know, so, you know, that 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 preparation side, it's vitally important. Really, uh, you know, uh, I'm such an early stage company. We were set up last year um, and 75,000 will make a huge difference to to my company. And, and was and, that a grant or, or is yeah. that equity? Or it's a grant. It's a grant. So it's you a don't grant. have to pay that back, Mark. No, no, I don't. Good for it's, you. It's, I, it's that's fantastic. Good for you. It's and really I'm a, fantastic. So when you're pretending to be in the West of Ireland, you're actually in the Bahamas. Isn't that right? <laughs> No, I'm the... actually in the west of Ireland, <laughs> okay. but this is a, a photograph of Valencia Island, actually. Um, I'm a in County woman. Kerry, lovely. Yes. <laughs> I was there a few years ago. It's, re it's really, really nice. Um, uh, but uh, I suppose the, the issue that you are raising is people have a perception. And this is, this is yeah. for Anne again, I suppose. People have a perception uh, that Europe, and Robert mentioned this, that Europe and the European Union is distant that it's, it's too far away, culturally, physically, whatever it is, and they won't consider my application anyway. Uh, and the, there's a psychological barrier, as well as all the alphabet soup that we spoke about in terms of agencies. But there's a psychological barrier that people need to get over. Uh, you've already talked about this, Anne, but I just want to stress it again that, that you know there are emails, there are phones, you can call people. In Ireland, speaking with Irish accents, who can break that barrier down? Absolutely, and I, and I think also your point about the psychological barrier is very well made. I saw a question there in, in around you know what what is the biggest barrier? Actually, we ourselves are the biggest barrier. It's a mindset. We need to change our mindset. We are Europeans. We have this enormous market sitting on our doorstep with no barriers to entry in terms of customs, tariffs, um, borders. You know, if you're looking at the Eurozone, there isn't even a currency challenge. So, you know, that's the opportunity. And in addition to that, we have all of these supports that Margaret spoke so well about there, Daniela and Sonia, all of these supports that are sitting there waiting for us to avail of them. So if there is a barrier, it's in our heads. Yeah. Can I stick with you? And don't worry, I'll come back to the other participants shortly. Um, I wonder whether Brexit might actually end up being a blessing in disguise in that it has forced many small companies in Ireland to wean themselves off the dependency of selling to uh, Britain and English speaking markets. Well, as you mentioned earlier, I was head of our Brexit unit. And so Brexit is super quiet, my favorite so very topics, quiet few years. Right? For you. So yeah. it was one of the most exciting jobs I ever had. And um, I think the first thing I'd say is we have a lot of business in the UK. It's an important market for us. We don't want to lose it. However, there is more opportunity. Just If you just base it simply on the sizes of the market, there is more opportunity in Europe. But there is also more opportunity in Europe because we don't have those barriers. We've always had a barrier with the UK in terms of currency since we joined the euro. And that is a significant, and maybe people don't see it as a barrier, but actually what it is, is it's an extra cost to your business. It's a variable, so, a variable changing in cost, yeah. It's, it, there's an, the uncertainty about it, but it, it actually costs to have to change currency mm -hmm. back and forth all the time. So, you know, the, there are enormous advantages. The UK is a market, it will always be a market for us, and it's a strong market for us, but there are enormous advantages in looking further afield. And by the way, we don't have to go very far. And France is very, very um, happy to continuously remind us that they are now our closest neighbour in the EU. So there's the French market literally sitting on our doorstep and all of the other markets around Europe. So yes, um, the, there, there are opportunities in the UK, but I do believe actually that Brexit could be the best thing that ever happened to Ireland because it is forcing us to be more economically independent and to look and diversify into more markets. Sonia, can I bring you in on that? You can unmute yourself. You, you uh, have customers in the UK. Um, did Brexit spur you on to looking further afield? 
We always have, as a company, had a vision of sort of being Europe's most accessible patient portal. So our vision is very much pan-European. Um, you know, we, we've been fantastically fortunate with the customers and collaborators we've had in the UK. But, you know, we want to create a greater foothold for our entity across continental Europe. Um, and, and that was why kind of quite early on in 2019, I did participate in the EIT Health uh, Bootcamp program. And I've participated with EIT Health all along the way since. Um, you know, so we, we've we've uh, been very fortunate to receive their Bridgehead Europe grant, uh, which you know again it's 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 forty thousand euros, um, and it supports us to do um, really exciting work with what they call catalyzers, where they have these essentially living labs and partners that can support you to accelerate your product in a given market. They do all of the work, you know, um, analyzing the market, finding partners and collaborators, a pilot site, helping us to understand the technical landscape, the telematic infrastructure, the certification and regulation we need to meet to get into particular markets so you know that's a massive support for us um, and yeah I mean you know we set up a, a UK subsidiary uh, pre-Brexit uh, we, we do have an entity there but but definitely our vision is pan-European um, and there are supports there very much like what Daniela said it's the funding but also it's the network that you create when you participate in these programs and receive these grants and funding opportunities um, it's the people you meet uh, it's the learnings that you gain about every market's intricate differences you know they all have slightly different requirements um, and expectations culturally politically uh, commercially uh, in terms of how you deliver a product there. Thank you very much, Sonia. Can you unmute yourself, Daniela, and I'll ask you kind of a similar related question. You um, you worked in Manchester, I think, uh, Daniela. Uh, I, I will come to my question in a moment, but my first most important question, as someone who lived in Britain for many years, um, is it wetter in Manchester or Dublin? <laughs> Um, I, I I think I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, I can't answer this question. I never thought about Dublin as a wet, you know, as wet city in the sense or, or Manchester, because I come from the from the south of Italy. Um, and, Which is uh, very, very wet. No, it, it's not wet, but it's very, it's very humid. It's very damp. So uh, for me, actually. But anyway, I'd say. Um, Manchester is, is wetter than <laughs> that is the correct answer. You move on to the next question, <laughs> which was which was um, when you are uh, when you are advising uh, companies and when you are thinking about your own business, um, do you think automatically UK first because it's easier culturally? Or do you say, listen, you should think seriously about Italy. You should think seriously about Croatia or Estonia or wherever. No, I, I, I consider UK as one of the, um, the country Well, they are not in Europe anymore. So that's one more reason, you know, why I actually consider less uh, UK than other countries. So, for example, I'll give you an example. I, uh, we just as InnoPharma, we submitted a um, proposal to Europe's so Horizon Europe and we coordinated a consortium. So that means that we build a consortium of people across Europe. And uh, one of the uh, people which reach out uh, was from um, Slovenia. Um, so there was one important actually member of the consortium from Slovenia. There's Finland, um, there's Spain, there's Italy actually. There's a great presence of Italy um, in, in the consortium. So no, I, I always um, felt uh, as I was a citizen of Europe, always. I've, I've been put on, on a plane since I was 11 to do the ex exchange you know, program. Um, and I always think there is a, 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 a crucial um, a really benefit in uh, exchanging with people from across Europe. So UK, yeah, they're they are across the sea. Uh, so yes, of course, it would be convenient. Uh, and I've lived in Manchester, great place, uh, but um, there's so many people across Europe, like in Croatia, Slovenia, um, as well as Germany, um, for example, that are doing great work. Um, and if you come together, so you bring together, put together a consortium and, and you really can achieve um, innovation um, if, if we do things together. Uh, talking of together, were you aware of the European Enterprise Network, this giant WhatsApp group that we were talking actually, about? Actually, no, this is news for me. Um, oh, there you go. I, yeah, that, that was actually great to hear. Um, so I'm always very, you know, um, aware of what, hap what happens you know, in terms of funding and opportunity. But that actually is it's nice uh, to hear. Uh, extremely important. 
and uh, as Robert said, um, you just need to sign up and, exactly. um, and then you suddenly you pick your area of expertise and you can speak to would be investors. You can speak to fellow entrepreneurs and startup companies and share ideas. And uh, I think Anne would fully support the idea that uh, Irish people and especially Italians, they love to chat and they love to share their experiences. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, they may have different quality coffee but they definitely love to share their experiences. Um, I do have a question for Sonia. Um, so Sonia, if you could unmute briefly. Uh, it comes in from Catherine Leslie. Um, uh, Sonia, could you, um, could you tell us more about your experience with the EU supports, um, her participation in the bootcamp, et cetera? You had mentioned that you had more detail to share about that, and it would be lo lovely to hear about it. That's from Catherine. Sonia. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question, Catherine. Um, uh, yeah, I, I really took advantage, is all I can say, of the European Institute of Technology and Innovation. They've been hugely supportive. Um, I did something called uh, the Digital Health Accelerator Bootcamp in Trinity in 2019. Um, that was funding of 10K, plus a tour around three countries in Europe, Living Labs, Accelerator Sites, um, a fantastic opportunity to meet partners, to understand if there was a need for your product in the market. Highly, I would highly recommend it. Um, we also participated in their mentor and coaching network. So that's two and a half thousand euro vouchers to engage with um, an expert of your choice, be it in the field of regulation or market entry, et cetera. And we've done that twice, once with Carl Quant in Germany and once with Swallow Ventures in Barcelona. Um, I participated in their women's entrepreneurship boot camp, the first, the first one that they ran, um, and that was run in collaboration with Yesse in Barcelona and the Galway uh, Institute of Technology as well. So um, it, it was very, very, uh, again, uh, insightful uh, learning, you know, and being, again, as you mentioned, Joe, connected with other founders that have similar experiences. And it's quite a unique experience, I think. And sometimes, as Francis mentioned, a lonely experience, um, you know, when you're an entrepreneur and particularly a female entrepreneur. So, so those programs are fantastic. Um, they run programs such as, uh, you know, Bridgehead, uh, Catalyzer, uh, where like that you can get a 30 or 40k uh, grant to expand into either Europe or beyond. Um, and again, they give you both the training, the network, the access to market, the funding. It's, it's fantastic. Um, there has been for me as well something called DigiBQ. So it's worthwhile watching out for what they call waterfall supports. So ultimately, you know, in that case, it was Horizon 2020 that offered the funding to a couple of entities in Austria and um, Oslo. And those entities then awarded grants down to the SME level. So I participated in that with Think Bio Solutions, who were another Irish company. Um, and fantastically, even, you know, the small supports, I know we're talking about really big, you know, 15 million grants from EIC, but even the small things are so helpful when you're on the journey. So for example, if you're looking at the moment to, to look into IP um, and protecting your, your product, you know, if you go, you know, it's James Walsh is the Enterprise Ireland um, point of contact. I worked with a gentleman called Janari Udu, who is an IP ambassador. Um, and essentially there are vouchers if you go to the, the website to, um, you know, two and a half grand or so to again, protect your trademark, uh, put some patent uh, designs in place, etc., cetera, and, and protect uh, your, your product in any way you can. So yeah, I've kind of, I'm happy to take it offline and, and give my, my details if, if, if Catherine would like to talk about it any further. Okay, well, thank you for that, Sonia. Um, I'm not sure. going to facilitate that get together. I'll, I'll leave that to IIEA, but thank you for your advice. Robert, could I ask you a question? Um, uh, we're, we're coming, you know, we're in the final furlong, as they say, in horse racing. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned getting your facts right, getting your details in order. And when you're, when you're applying, make sure that you have a look at the criteria. Um, what are the biggest mistakes that SMEs make when it comes to their application? Is it leaving out detail? Is it not having the appropriate uh, documentation? That could be uh, letters from the banks, et cetera, like that. What, what are the biggest mistakes that you see or hear of uh, at the European Innovation Council? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's exactly these kinds of things. It's, um, it's, it's the, the, the eye for detail and, um, and to making sure that whatever is required is submitted and and this is really something that um again i want to stress that the opportunities really are there but there's enormous competition so if you do not have the basics right then it's easy to put your proposal aside because there are all the others that are that have uh, done the homework uh 
to, in that uh, respect. So it, it's really looking carefully about about you know, to to what is being asked. What do you need to submit in terms of your 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 bank statements, etc. And yes, sometimes this is quite a bit of work, but the rewards are there. So I would say uh, don't don't be um, uh, daunted by this because it is worth it. Um, and and yes, sometimes it can seem complex, but if you take a bit of time to look through what is there and make use of all these support networks that are there, the opportunities really are, uh, are worth the, uh, the investment in time uh, to look into it. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Anne, can I bring you in? Anne, uh, from, Anne Lanigan from Enterprise Ireland. Uh, and there's a very ancient aphorism in Ireland called, sure, it'll be grand. <laughs> and I wonder whether a lot of our compatriots suffer from that. Well, I guess, you know, us Irish do suffer a little bit from that. But I, I would have to say, Joe, the companies that we are seeing coming into Europe now are doing a fantastic job. You know, they are doing it right. They are taking the advice. They are preparing. You know, they're putting together market entry plans. So um, I think that you know, when when we're used to operating in the Irish and the UK market, we know each other very well, you know, and, and, and so maybe it's easier to do the, you know, how to be grand. But in Europe, you need to be more professional and more sophisticated. There's a lot of competition out there. But we are seeing companies doing that and we're seeing them doing it extremely well. And I think one point I would like to make is the reputation of Irish companies Irish people, Irish products, Irish services across Europe is extremely high. Um, and, and that is, you know, we're pushing an open door here. There's lots of opportunity and there is an openness to working with Irish people. We're seen as being the other side of that, that will be grand is the flexibility that we bring. And we're seen as flexible and adaptable and nothing is too much. If a client is looking for something to change, an Irish company will typically provide that. So, you know, we're doing a good job. We just need to do an awful lot more of it. And, and what I'd like to see is more companies entering into the market. One other thing I wanted to mention as well was in relation to RI supports coming out of um, the EU, we do have a liaison office in Enterprise Ireland who can specifically help with that. So Horizon, for example, which is quite a complicated um, application process, we do have people who will hold your hand um, in our offices in Dublin in order to help you get through that process. So back to Robert's point about, you know, you do need to prepare properly and, and apply, um, you know, as professionally as you can, and we can help you with that. Yeah, and, and that's all reachable on the Enterprise Ireland website. I it is, that. it yeah. is. Okay, well, listen, we're, we're in the final straight now. Uh, final thoughts, Daniela and Gione. Um, any, any final tips that you would give to those people considering uh, spreading their wings into the rest of the EU? Uh, what I would just say is um, just put yourself out there. Um, there. There's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of help, as Anne just said. Uh, you, I, I get to, to work and to talk all the time with people in Enterprise Island that are looking, for example, to um, support you and, and help you choose what kind of program out there is uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a good fit for the company. Um, and they are great. Um, they will review your proposal as well. Um, so what I'm trying to say, don't be shy. Go out there. There is, there's great, great opportunities. Uh, only opportunities, not barriers. I don't see any barriers. So please do. Wonderful. Uh, Sonia Neary, you can unmute yourself. Any final tips and advice? Oh, wow. Um, I don't know how to follow that. I completely agree with Daniela. I think it's, you know, as an island, we have to take a pan-European vision. We have to take a global vision. Um, and some fantastic companies have gone ahead of us and made it look easy. And I think we should follow their path. OK, well, let's let's move on finally to Margaret Ray uh, from uh, Kin Conry. Yeah, I, well, I, I, you know, the, the Women Tech EU, the f only 50 companies were, was, you know, funded this year, but, you know, 130 companies next year is, is the expectation. So, um, you know, diversify your, your C-suite, make sure that there's women on board, you know, who can apply for this, it basically is my encouragement. And all of those women-led companies out there, apply, 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 it's worth it. Super. Well, would that all my contributors were as concise and short and brief and uh, clear as that. Uh, thank you so much to all of you. Thank you, Margaret Ray uh, from Conry Innovation. Thank you, Sonia Neary from Wellola. 
thank you, Anne Lanigan, the Regional Director for the Eurozone Central and Eastern Europe at Enterprise Ireland. Thank you, of course, and grazie to Daniela Angioni uh, from Inno Pharma and other companies. And uh, herzlichen Dank, uh, bedankt to Robert Schröder from the uh, snappily titled EISMEA. My name is Joe Lynham. We now have one very clear message. Don't be shy. Do apply. Oh, that rhymes. Don't be shy. Do apply. But do do your research and make sure you don't have the kind of sure it'll be grand attitude. So from all of us here at the IIEA and Enterprise Ireland, my name is Joe Lynham. I really enjoyed sharing today. Get the applications in. Ciao for now.